Cultural Resource Laws and Practices by Thomas King, 4th edition, Chapter 1. Cultural Resource Management. Why is it? What is it? Who does it? <clears throat> the Voice of the People. Chitaro's house stood on a rocky ledge overlooking Poway Midden. Dark soil charged with marine shells and animal bones. Detritus of meals consumed over generation, the stuff that archaeologists ex excavate. Stream down the slope, Chiatra was the political chief of Michitu village. His green tin roofed plywood bungalow, visible from much of the village, reflected his place in the community with my wife. Cultural anthropologist Patricia Parker, I had come to pay respects to him and to Teru Teruio, Mitch Tu's high chief and senior elder. It was 1979. We were leaving the islands of Chuck in Micronesia after two eventful years. Pat had completed her dissertation field work in nearby Eros village. I had finished my contract as consultant to the high commissioner of the trust territory of the Pacific Islands. Archaeology and historic preservation Unquote. A contract the High Com would happily have terminated a year earlier had not the National Park Service, NPS, and the Congress of Micronesia persuaded him to reconsider. Pat and I mediated a dispute between the Trust Territory government and the villages of Aras and Mekchiku sorry, over construction of an airport on the fringe of their tradition hunt haunted mountain. Tanacha, now we are leaving great with child, experience and research data to face new challenges back on the mainland. We chatted over instant coffee laced with sweetened canned milk, a contemporary check Chukasi tradition. Then Teru reached into a dusty corner and pulled out a magnificent conch shell. Conches in Micronesia, as throughout the Pacific, are used as trumpets. The chief blows into the conch, producing a piercing wailing moan that summons the people to the what, the meeting house, to ponder issues or respond to threats to mobilize for war. With trembling hands, he drank a lot of coffee. Teruio presented the conch to me. Pat translated, when you are back in Washington in the, that White House, keep this to remember the voice of the people. I have not made it to the White House except on tours and to a reception or two, but I keep the conch in a prominent place still specked with the Chitaro's greenhouse paint to remind me of what I'm about. Sometimes I pick it up and think about the about Teruya's words. Over the decades, particularly since the 1960s, the U.S. Congress has enacted laws aimed at controlling the federal government's impacts on the environment. Among these laws dealing with that, with what have come to be called cultural resources, variously defined, but certainly having something to do with human culture and analyzing impacts on such resources and in considering what to do with them, it should go without saying, but doesn't, that we should listen to and try to understand the voice of the people, unquote, whose cultural values give meaning to the resources. This book is about the cultural resource laws of the United States and the regulations, standards, and guidelines that flow from them. It is about practice under those laws, regulations, standards, and guidelines. As I understand it, Sounds boring. It can be not, it can be, but not necessarily, and not always. The laws have made a, a difference and they continue to. They have stopped projects that would have destroyed places people hold dear. They have caused changes to be made in such pro projects to mitigate the damage they do. They have sparked lawsuits and congressional hearings, and they have affected the careers of civil servants military personnel and political leaders on some happy occasions they have worked so culture so that cultural concerns are integrated into planning allowing contemporary needs to be fulfilled while treasured aspects of the cultural environment 
<clears throat> are respected. One of the purposes of this book is to help people, organizations, and agencies achieve such win-win solutions. Many people today specialize in working with the cultural resource level laws. As attorneys, as government, Indian tribal, and corporate officials, as consultants, and as field researchers, such work can be professionally challenging and satisfying. It can also be frustrating in large part because the laws, regulations, standards, and guidelines have been developed with little reference to any overall vision and with little coordination. They can appear to contradict one another and they can be interpreted in many ways, some of them weird. They have spawned institutions whose goals do not always coincide with another or I believe with the purpose, purposes of, of the laws and whose procedures and sometimes cross cut and conflict with one another. So another thing in this, another thing this book will do is reflect on some of these problems as I see them and where I can suggest ways to fix them. What are cultural resources? You might think that cultural resources are resources, things that can be used as the dictionary that are related to culture. This word usually taken to mean the beliefs, values, and ways of life that people pass from generation to generation. I think that's what the term should mean. Quote, cultural resources should be understood at those aspects of the environment, both physical and intangible, both natural and built, that have cultural value to a group of people. The group can be a community, a neighbor, a tribe, or any of the scholarly and not so scholarly disciplines that value cultural things. Archaeologists, architectural historians, folklorists, and cultural anthropologists, the definition should include the, those non-material non human social institutions that help make up the environment in our heads. Our social institutions, our beliefs, our custom practices, and our percep perceptions of what makes the environment culturally comfortable Cultural resource management, unquote, CRM, ought to mean managing all these cult social cultural aspects of the environment and all the contemporary world's impact, impact on them. That ought to be how the term is understood, not only because it's what the words mean in commonplace English, but also because collectively the laws we'll discuss in this book address all those resource types. Albeit in uneven, uncoordinated ways, unfortunately, Congress has never gotten around to enacting a comprehensive cultural resource law. Instead, we have a hodgepodge of laws regulations, and executive orders, each dealing with a particular kind of cultural resource. Figure 1.1 is an effort to diagram the relationships between, I'm sorry, among the resource types to which the laws apply, and Table 1.1 roughly outlines the legal authorities that relate to each type. In the competition for federal agency attention, and funding, like legal authorities that aren't the subjects of binding regulations lose out, and the resource types to which they refer get ignored. Although the regulations implementing the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, theoretically require attention to all aspects of human, of the human environment, including its social cultural aspects, those regulations are so broad, so generally, and frankly, so obtuse that they don't provide much direction. So only historic properties, archeological subject of its own purpose, laws and regulations get more or less routine attention. And most CRM practitioners act as though these are the only cultural resources that exist. Here's table 1.1. This is too bad. Culture is big complex part of our world. Its resources are many and diverse. They are interrelated and subjective and cultural and culture def deeply affects what we do and how we relate to one another. Flying airplanes into buildings on September 11, 2001 was an act of terrorism, but it was also a cultural act. As we were at a 
as were the attacks on Afghanistan and Iraq that it precipitated. Unrest in China, ferment in the Islamic world, and acceptance and rejection of economic globalization all reflect the ways people look at the world and life and each other through cultural lenses. Policy disrespects culture at its peril. But in planning and carrying out government programs and projects, we do precisely that. We ignore culture, expect to, into extent, to the extent that it is haphazardly considered by individual members of Congress and federal agency decision makers, or to the extent we are forced to consider it by a rate, citizens, and social crisis. We ought to have a thoughtful, sensitive, comprehensive way of planning and carrying out government operations with respects for all parts of the social, socio-cultural environment, but we don't. We have fairly organized through the highly bureau bureaucratized, and accessible, and increasingly ineffective ways of considering the impacts of plans and actions on historic places, archaeological sites, and Native American graves, and cultural items overlapping resource types that make up mostly discrete chunks of real estate. The rest of the sociocultural environment in the United States and other nations we more or less ignore. In this book, we will like everybody else spend most of our time dealing with historic places, archaeological sites, and Native American graves and cultural items. But let no one think that this is as it should be, as it must be, or even as the laws collectively require it to be. Perhaps someday wise and influential political leaders will recognize that it would be sensible to attend the impacts of government actions on the whole cultural environment and they will clarify the law accordingly. Until that happens, we can only work with what we have. An exemplary catastrophe, the African burial ground. I'm so sorry, guys. A classic example of how our narrow-minded handling of cultural resources can lead to disaster is the case of the African burial ground in New York City. In the late 17th and early 18th centuries, the African burial ground was a low area among the sand dunes of Manhattan Island, a short distance outside the walls of New Amsterdam. Enslaved Africans, yes, there were slaves in New York then, and their equally enslaved descendants buried their dead there. Later, the area was buried as the dunes were leveled and New York spread north. The street called Broadway was built over one side of the cemetery, which had been more or less forgotten. In the 1980s, Congress directed the U.S. General Services Administration, GSA, to build a new federal office building on the Broadway block. A parcel of land just east of Broadway, GSA did an environmental assessment during which an old map was found showing the 18th century. Quote, Negro burial ground, unquote. The environmental assessment was prepared by a planning firm that was under contract to the design and development firm that was under contract to GSA to design and build the new facility. This firm in turn subcontracted with an archaeological company to do the cultural resource work. The resource, the burial ground, was perceived to be an archaeological site. Archaeologists could be hired to dig up remove its contents to a laboratory and study and report on it. And that would be that. No one seems to have felt the need to find out how New York's African-American community might feel about the place. When the burial ground was actually encountered and turned out to be bigger and more intact than anyone expected, all hell broke loose. African Americans in New York and across the country around and around the world vehemently protested the des desecration of their ancestors' remains. Congress intervened and project the project had to be redesigned to preserve some of the bodies while the rest were subjected to extensive and expensive excavation and analysis preparatory to reburial. The construction contractor was 
awarded massive penalty payments because of the delay. The last time I checked, the cost of the fiasco to the U.S. taxpayer had been upwards of $80 million. Today, a monument stands on the site in belated recognition of the people buried there. Lots of things caused the African burial ground to bite GSA hard, but one of the most important was the the site was misperceived at the outset. The moment the map was found the, with quote, Negro burial ground, unquote, on it, somebody should have recognized that the place would have emotional, cultural importance to African Americans. Intensive consultation should have been undertaken and a cooperative program should have been developed with the African American community. As was successfully done in a similar case in Philadelphia, dealing with the burial ground would still have been less expensive. Well, I'm sorry, would still have been expensive, but it would co have cost a lot less than $80 million. And it could have been done in a calmer, more orderly, less contentious manner. But the cultural value of the site was instead a instead equated with archaeological research value and it was assumed that the archaeologists by themselves could preserve that value the notion of what constituted a cultural resource was too narrowly constructed and the results were costly my point is simple cultural resources make a big a big complex intricate mosaic of things and institutions and values, beliefs, and perceptions, customs and traditions and symbols and social structures, and it's integral into what makes people and communities communities. So it's charged with a great deal of emotion as a result. Cultural resource management should involve a great deal more than archeology span or architectural history or folklore or historic preservation. It needs to deal with management of the whole cultural environment and the effects of contemporary plans and decisions on that environment in all its aspects to make it do this. However, we have to be creative, and there is nothing in laws, regulations, or the traditions of most government agencies that encourages creativity. Cultural resources, cultural heritage. In many countries and in some international contexts, the term quote, cultural heritage, unquote, is used to mean roughly the same range of things we, that we in the United States call cultural resources, unquote. I think heritage is a better word than resource to refer to such things. It seems less loutishly materialistic, but we in the United States seem to have stuck ourselves with resource. So in the interest of communicating with my problem, with my problem, probable readers, I've stuck with it too. Those familiar with laws and practices in other parts of the world, however, should understand that to me, at least, the terms cultural resource and cultural heritage mean the same thing. Cultural resources and social impacts. CRM, as I understand it, closely related to and overlaps with another acronym's, acronyms ac Acronymous Body of Practice, I'm so sorry, Social Impact Assessment, SIA. SIA means analyzing, monitoring, and managing the intended and un unintended social consequences, both positive and negative, of planned interventions, policies, programs, plans, projects, and any social change processes invoked by those interventions. SIA is sometimes cast as a socioeconomic impact assessment, whereupon it takes on the dismal characteristics of economics and ignores the sociocultural factors that are the subjects of this book. SIA has its own interesting story, history, and its own rules of practice. We'll discuss some of these in the chapters to come. Cultural Resources and Historic Preservation.
Like cultural resource, the term historic preservation has a range of meanings, but I'll, find, I'll follow Congress and the National Historic Preservation Act, NHPA, in understanding it to include identification, evaluation, recordation, documentation, curation, acquisition, protection, management, rehabilitation, res restoration, stabilization, maintenance, re research, interpretation, and conversation. Oh, conserv conservation of historic properties and education and training regarding the foregoing activities or any combination of the foregoing activities. Nobody ever accused Congress of elegant wordsmithing. Historic property, unquote, by the way, is defined in the same statute as any his prehistoric or historic district site, building, structure, or object included in or eligible for inclusion on the National Register of Historic Places, including artifacts, records, and material remains related to such property. Historic preservation deals with one kind of cultural resource, the historic property. Historic preservation has highly developed, perhaps overdeveloped body of pr procedure operating at the federal and local levels and in international, regional, state, and Indian tribal contexts. Because this corpus of law and regulation is so well developed and sometimes so obscure, much of this book is devoted to discussing it. This shouldn't blind us, however, to the fact that historic preservation is only one part of CRM and not necessarily the most important part. Compliance and beyond. Compliance is another word with multiple, usually implicit definitions. To an environmental engineer, compliance means compliance with the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CRCLA, and other laws that seek to control or clean up toxic and hazardous waste. It's not unrecognized that other laws must be complied with, unquote, too, but it's only CRCLA and its toxic tinted kin that are seen as, quote, real compliant subjects. This is probably because only those these laws as opposed to those that will be discussed in this book, impose jail terms and fines on individual violators. In historic preservation and other areas of cultural resource management compliance is taken to mean doing what the laws, notably Section 106 of NHPA, require to manage a project's impacts if one does some kind of positive management. One goes beyond compliance which is always applauded. I think this distinction is silly and rather sad. It's silly because positive management is the reason for compliance. Congress did not enact Section 106, and it's ilk just to cause agencies to pass papers around. Compliance with the law ought to result in thoughtful, balanced management of cultural resources and impacts on them. Compliance ought not to be minimalist sort of thing. If it doesn't result in a positive management, what good is it? It's silly too because of an agency that's encouraged to think it's going beyond compliance when it manages a cultural resource well. That is, that's it's that it's doing more than the law requires. Isn't going to keep doing is. It when faced with conflicting demands. Stuff that's, quote, nice to do, but not required by law, won't get done when budgets shrink or demands grow. Those who turn up their noses at compliance and pat themselves on the back for getting their employers or clients to go beyond it live in a fool's paradise. And it's sad because it reflects acceptance of a notion of compliance-driven cultural resource work as not entirely relevant to real management, and hence to the public interest. If widely accepted, this notion would mean that most of the multi-million dollar business of CRM 
which like it or not is compliance driven, is no of no real worth. If it's true and we want to be responsible citizens, we'd like better to better look for new careers. I believe that compliance and good management are essentially the same. Certainly compliance requires that we dot certain procedure I's and cross certain procedural T's. But this is this no more makes it poor management than good architectural draftsmanship. Means bad building design. Properly done, compliance should result in good management, and good management should put an agency in compliance with the law. That said, I'll cheerfully acknowledge that this book is about procedural manners. Matters. The substance of CRM, how in a hands-on way one manages an archaeological site or book or an old building or impacts on a life way, <clears throat> is a many splintered thing. There are so many possibilities that I wouldn't even know where to begin. Process the subject of this book of how, is how possibilities get explored, selected, and implemented. Mm -hmm. To me, this is a fascinating subject, and I hope it can be to the reader as well. In any event, it's something that a cultural resource manager mm -hmm. must know. Mm -hmm. If he or she is to be effective, mm -hmm. it depends. One of the most commonly used phrases in this book is it depends, unquote. However much people might want things. I'm sorry, this book is hard to hold. However much people might want things to be otherwise, there are a few, if any, hard and fast rules in CRM. How do we identify cultural resources? It depends on the law with which we're trying to comply. The kinds of cultural resources that might be that may be involved, the kinds of things that may affect them, and other factors. How do we determine whether something's significant? It depends on the kind of thing, the values that people load on it, and so forth. How do we determine how to manage something? It depends on the thing. The management challenges the public or private interests we're seeking to achieve or accommodate, and so on. Some people are frustrated by this kind of ambiguity. They want a cookbook for such people. I'd suggest culinary school rather than CRM. Though I think you'll find that even the temperature at which water boils depends on the altitude. Everything in life, and cer certainly in CRM, depends on something else. There aren't any absolutes. Everything is contingent. Absolutes are nice for lazy thinkers, but they think they have no or they have no place in creative management. So I use it depends. Unquote. A lot I'll try to explain what it is that for specific things depend on and why and how to get along without absolutes. But I don't I want but I won't apologize for their for their non-existence. Actually, I think CRM would be pretty a pretty dull sub, sub enterprise if there were a lot of absolutes on which to rely. And CRM is not a dull enterprise. Who should read this book? This book is designed for use in college, universities, and continuing education classes in historic preservation, environmental studies social impact assessment and CRM. It's intended to help people help students understand CRM principles, policies and procedures. It's meant to supplement and be supplemented by texts dealing with more specific topics and with more general subjects like environmental impact assessment EIA with which CRM interacts. Much of it's derived from this from syllabi that others and I have developed for short courses in historic preservation and CRM sponsored by the National Preservation Institute Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, ACHP, MPS, SWCA, Environmental Consultants, and others. So it's also intended for people who frequent such courses or would, if they could afford to, 
Typically, environmental and historic preservation people in federal and state agencies, local governments, Indian tribes, and Native Hawaiian organizations, as well as consultants in EIA and CRM. Finally, parts of this book are designed for colleagues who have flat flattered me by suggesting that I have something to contribute their understanding of the laws and regulations and to debating the principles that underlie them. My knowledge of the legal authorities varies. I know a good deal about them, about some of them, though, and can speculate about a good deal more. I have speculated freely in the following chapters and have expressed my opinions liberally in the hope of stimulating discussion. A word to applicant for federal assistance and permits. Some, maybe many, readers probably work for land developers, regulated utilities, and others who apply for federal assistance or permits to do their work, and hence are affected by the federal cultural resource laws, even though Technically, they don't have to comply with them. These readers <clears throat> or their employers foot the bill for much, if not most, CRM work. But few of the laws or regulations speak to them directly. If an applicant wants to get his or get his or her federal grant or permit, it's going to be necessary to pay to help the granting or permitting agency to fulfill its regulatory obligations. An applicant may not like this, but it, it really is only fair. Why should the taxpayer pay to determine what impacts an applicant's project will have? Well, one might argue because the taxpayer is going to benefit the, from the project or from minimizing its impacts. Sure, one might rejoin, but it's the applicant who's going to benefit most directly from the project and the public that's going to suffer the impacts. However we may feel about it, though the bottom line is that in general, it's the applicant who pays for the legwork and compliance, but it's the permitting or assistance agency that actually has to comply. So they're the ones who have to make sure the work meets legal muster and they're the ones who are supposed to interact with the other players in the project review process, see below. Sometimes they won't even let the applicant communicate with the other players or those players don't want to communicate with the applicant. There are reasons for this. The assistance permitting agencies don't want to lose control of what are after all, their obligations, the external players don't want to be driven crazy by applicants hammering on their doors. They'd rather deal with the more or less known qu quantity represented by federal agencies. This is not the, always the case. Though some state historic preservation officers, SHPOs, for example, would rather deal with applicants directly. They find it simpler and think that the applicants tend to be more knowledgeable and reasonable than the agencies. True story. I once had as a client a power company that wanted to build a, tra a transmission line. All of those feasible alternative routes crossed both federal and non-federal land. The SHPO said, and I think he was right, that in order for the land managing agency to consider the effects of issuing a right of way, it had to be consider it had to consider the entire project, including all its impacts on non-federal land. My clients who felt that they had to do this anyway, both because of other legal obligations and simply as good business were willing to do what the SHPO wanted, but the land managing agency won't, wouldn't buy it. Its policy was to res restrict attention to the lands under its own control. With the SHPO and agency locked in combat over what the agency was required to do, my client was left twiddling its corporate, corporate thumbs while the bills mounted. Eventually the project was abandoned. So how do you avoid this kind of thing? You need expertise, and it's probably not gonna it's 
probably not cost effective for you to maintain it in-house. So you contract for it. Fair enough, but be careful. There are CRM consulting firms whose people knows know the laws and regulations and can envision creative, cost-effective, responsible ways of complying with them. But there are a lot more who only know there is some kind of law that requires you to pay them what pay them to do what they understand to be compliance unquote work, and they all know only one or maybe two ways to do it. These ways typically featuring standard field surveys and digging up archaeological sites or carefully documenting the architectural qualities of buildings really have little to do with what the laws require, but many consulting firms are comfortable doing them and don't know how to do anything else. They can give you very costly bad advice. So you need to know something yourself about how the laws work, which is probably why you're looking at this book. My introductory suggestion to you is that you do look at it. Try not to get frustrated by the fact that it like the laws and regulation it interprets don't speak directly to you and think about what it does mean to you in real world terms. I'll try to offer pertinent suggestions where I can, I can, to, where I can to help you think about ways to relate creativ creatively to what agencies may require you to do and to what the laws themselves require. A word to NIMBYs. Project proponents and regulatory agencies huff and puff a lot about N-I-M-B-Y-S. People who say it, not in my backyard. To develop d development, but NIMBYs want to keep things out of their backyards because they really like their backyards as they are and often that's because their backyards have a deep cultural meaning to them. They are, in fact, cultural resources, so NIMBYs, I hope this book will be helpful to you in using the cultural resource laws to promote respect for your values, your treasured cultural resources. It will give you an idea of what federal agencies should do under NEPA, NHPA, and NHPA and other laws. Regrettably, it's pretty much up to you to make sure that they do it. You're not likely to have much help and those who want to destroy your backyards will fight you with every weapon at their disposable, notably lots of money. In the years since this book earlier editions were published, I've become convinced that the whole CRM EIA business has become hopelessly corrupted that the deck is stacked heavily against NIMBYs and in general against affected people whose voices should be heard and attended to by a system that puts all the power in the hands of project proponents and virtually requires impact assessors to play on the proponents team. So don't let me mislead you. NIMBYs you have an uphill battle to use <clears throat> the cultural resource laws to save what's important to you and will continue to have such battles until you, I, or we can change the laws. For the moment in this book, I'll, I'll try to throw hints to you wherever I can about ways to use the laws at least to worry the destroyers as they bulldoze ahead. Laws, Regulations, and Alphabet Soup. Some readers of earlier editions have complained that they get lost in the alphabet soup of government agencies. I don't know what to do about that other than the issue, than to assure you that you're not alone. We all get confused when the acronyms and phrase fragments start flying. I'll try to make things as clear as I can, and some help is provided in the back of the book. Terms of art and acronyms are listed for quick reference in Appendix 1, and where necessary, defined in Appendix 2. The laws we'll be discussing 
are summarized in Appendix 3 with references to websites where you can find complete texts of laws, regulations, guidelines, and other relevant documents. A bit of history. Where did cultural resource management in the United States come from? A real discussion of the field's history and history would take another book, but let's summarize. In the beginning, the U.S. government began managing cultural resources in 1800 when Congress appropriated $5,000 to purchase books and create the L Library of Congress. Around the same time, France came up with the idea of listing old buildings that the government thought ought to be preserved. In a cooling of revolutionary passions that had threatened destruction of everything associated with the ancient regime, this idea would be taken up by other European countries and eventually by the United States. After the Civil War, the Smithsonian Institution and the De Department of In the Interior began to do ethnographic and archaeological re research, and the War Department started to acquire and preserve battlefields. Private parties and local governments began acquiring and preserving historic buildings and structures, but this was not s seen as a function of the federal government. Management of impacts on the less tangible elements of the cultural environment was not even a gleam if anyone's eye. In 1906, driven by hingnostic concern about foreigners taking antiquities from federal land, Congress enacted the Antiquities Act. This law prohibited the excavation of antiquities from public lands without a permit from the Secretary of Interior. In 1916, was the M MPS was created, giving the nation an agency with conservation of natural and cultural resources as a part of its mission. Management of historic battlefields were transferred to MPS from the War Department. <clears throat> The Depression years, some of the make work unquote programs called created to pull the country out of the Great Depression had implications for CRM. Out of work historians were paid to write local and regional histories. Out of work architects were deployed to make measured drawings of historic buildings. All manner of people were hired to work on archeological projects, mostly salvaging material and data in advance of construction by the Tennessee Valley Author Authority and other agencies. NPS gathered some of these programs under its wing, giving them continuing life. Authority to do this came in 1935 when the Historic Sites Act authorized a continuing program of recording, documenting, acquiring, and managing places important in the interpretation and commemorating of the nation's history. The places came to be called National Historic Landmarks, and the French concept of an official register of historic places became embedded in those in the consciousness of the U.S. government. Local governments pioneered the idea that what should be preserved was not just isolated great buildings, but whole neighborhoods. Thus, the old and historic district in Charleston, South Carolina, and the view of Carr in New Orleans were recognized as historic districts. This represented an important departure for historic preservations relating to the idea of preservation to urban planning and making every citizen's house, environment, and neighborhood the prime focus of concern and action. World War II and beyond. Contact with other cultures during World War II affected Americans' perception of themselves and their own cultural resources. The rapid pace of socioeconomic change after the war caused Americans to begin worrying about what they were losing. At war's end, the Corps of Engineers went to work building dams and reservoirs. While in the 1950s, President Eisenhower launched con construction of the interstate highway system, both these programs did alarming damage to historic neighborhoods, building structures and archeological sites. And the government responded, albeit rather haltingly, 
NPS and the Smithsonian Institute organized the River Basin Survey Program to salvage archaeological sites threatened by Corps reservoirs in, and in 1960, Congress passed the Reservoir Salvage Act, authorizing appropriations to NPS for the program. NPS also helped create a nonprofit organization to promote historic preservation. The National Trust for Historic Preservation, originally conceived largely by the NPS historians and architectural historians, was chartered in 1949. Historic preservation practitioners began to emphasize preserving buildings in their social and architectural contexts, not just as isolated artifacts. Conferences explored the relationships of historic preservation to urban planning. New international bodies like the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNICEFCO, adopted policies and recommendations calling attention to historic landmarks, fine architecture, and archaeological sites. The notion of preservation as a quality of life issue for all citizens achieved widespread acceptance. Powstar progress in cultural resource management was not limited to historic preservation and archaeology. The environmental movement was stirring in response to some of the same challenges that alarmed archaeologists and architectural historians while for focused initially on nature to the near exclusion of the cultural environment. Environmentalism like preservation soon expanded beyond preoccupation with the greatest, most pristine places and became something that all people could claim, <coughs> excuse me, as their own. <coughs> excuse me. In this context, the human affected environment began to stir interest. At the same time, the burgeoning of the federal government and its paperwork had created the need for a more orderly approach to records management. The Federal Records Act became law in 1950, creating the basis for today's methods of archiving historical government documents. Excuse me. Urban Renewal, the Great Society, and NHPA. The Kennedy administration accelerated natural and cultural resource destruction by launching urban renewal laying waste to historic slums with the expectation that cities of the future would rise on their ruins. Reaction to urban renewal was not limited to mainstream historic preservation. Communities began to object to what the program was doing to the architectural and cultural fabric that reflected their identity. The Johnson administration, as part of the beautification program overseen, by the lady, late Lady Bird Johnson gave its blessing to study whose 1965 comprehensive report with heritage so rich recommended creation of a nation national historic preservation program and sketched its broad outlines. The, this recommendation was transformed into legislation with lightning speed and enacted as the NHPA in 1966. The same Congress acted, enacted the Department of Transportation Act, including its conservationist section at 4F. NHPA created most of the institutions that are central to the historic preservation part of CRM today. It authorized NPS to expand and maintain a national register of historic places, including properties of local, state, and national historical culture cultural, archaeological, and architectural significance. It created the ACHP to advise the president to end Congress on historic preservation. It authorized grants to states to assist them in historic preservation to be administered by state liaison officers who later came to be known as SHPOs. And it included at section 106, a requirement that agencies consider the effects of their actions on places included in the National Parks Service, Services National Register. The 1960s were also the heyday of the civil rights movement, including what came to be known as the Indian Civil Rights Movement. During the 1950s, the government had gone through 
one of its periodic infatuations with the termination of Indian tribes and the absorption of Indian people into the great American melting pot. In reaction, the Indian Civil Rights Movement included a strong element of traditional heritage, a desire to reclaim and assert the legitimacy of tribal roots. Two decades later, this was to bring tribes into the CRM picture as major players. With shallower roots in North America, African Americans and other minority groups didn't have the same kinds of connections with the physical environment that Native Americans did and so have not as groups been as integrally involved in historic preservation, though there are exceptions. During the 1960s, however, virtually all minority groups began to insist with increasing intensity on respect for their cultural traditions. The resulting perception of diversity as a positive thing as had has had profound impacts on cultural resource management. Institution building in the 1970s. In response to NHPA, NPS reorganized its archaeological and historic preservation programs into a new Office of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, OAHP. The National Register and the ACHP were made parts of the OAHP with Ernest A. Connolly of the University of Illinois School of Architecture at its head, Robert R. Garvey Jr. and William J. Maturoff of the National Trust were wooed away by the MPS to head the ACHP and the National Register, respectively. Both were important in relating historic preservation to the broader cultural environment. Garvey was a grassroots preservationist without academic credentials who saw preservation as something that should benefit ordinary people. Murta had and has a keen sense of the need for historical historic properties to be living parts of the contemporary environment. While MPS was organizing OHP, the environmental movement was gaining increasing congressional attention with the publication and widespread popularity of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. The need for government action to protect the environment came to be widely recognized. One result was an enactment of an a NEPA in 1969. The NEPA articulated national policy favoring the environmental, I'm sorry, favoring environmental protection created the Council on Environmental Quality, I'm sorry, CEQ, and required agencies to consider the effects of their actions on the quality of human environment, unquote. The new law was especially important for CRM because considering environmental impacts required agency infrastructure. Each federal agency, more or less, began to develop some kind of environmental staff and EIA procedures to ensure more or less that its actions were viewed through environmental sensitive eyes because the NEPA explicitly focused on the human environment and called for interdisciplinary analysis involving the social sciences, SIA, soon became part of the EIA mix and began to develop an identity of its own. SIA addressed the relationships between sociocultural systems and the natural and built environments and it considered the impacts of proposed actions on aspects of the environment at, that are purely social, such as life ways and value systems. It took a while for a relationship to develop between historic preservation and environmental impact review. Although one of the first cases reviewed under NHPA's section 106 involving a proposed nuclear power plant across the river from Saratoga battlefield, raised such environmental issues as indirect and visual impacts. Historic preservation remained peripheral to EIA per practice under NEPA because NHPA's Section 106, as enacted, required agencies to concern themselves only with impacts on places included on, in the National Register. 
These, of course, are were few in number since the register had barely been created. All an agency had to do to avoid dealing with impacts on historic properties was to keep anyone from nominating them. This problem was alleviated in 1972 when President Nixon is issued Executive Order 11593. In effect, this executive order directed agencies to treat eligible properties as though they were listed in the register and ordered MPS to establish procedures for determining eligibility. The executive order, together with court cases and other historic preservation tussles in the early 1970s, got the agency's attention and they got they began to incorporate preservation expertise and procedures into the into their environmental prog programs. The three executors and hegemony of archaeology. This process was hastened and given direction to when MPS sent three executive order consult consultants to pros proselytize the agencies. Larry Atten, John Young, and Roy Reeves were very effective in their roles as knights errant jawboning agencies into hiring preservation specialists, creating programs for executive order compliance. All three archaeologists and the agencies they targeted for attention were those with the greatest impacts on archaeological sites. Construction agencies like the Corps of Engineers and land managing agencies like the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management, BLM, Partly as a result, uh, these agencies came to equate historic preservation with archaeology and to hire archaeologists to run their preservation programs. The perception of historic preservation as something done by and for archaeologists remains common in the construction of l and land management agencies to this day. Another reason for this perception was that the archaeological community under the leadership of Robert McGinsey of Arkansas took in the late 1960s to expand the scope of the 1960 Reservoir Salvage Act. The aim of McGinsey campaign was to require all agencies to identify archaeological sites threatened by their actions and to fund recovery of the data they contained, although this initiative was undertaken without reference to NHPA and Executive Order 11593. A 10 of NPS in particular took pains to build bridges between OAHP and the archaeological agitators, McGimsey had meanwhile formed a liaison with Richard Laverty, head of the Corps of Engineers Environmental Program. As a result, when the desired amendment was enacted as the Moss Bennett Act of, in 1974, things were in place to ensure that its impl implementation would be integrated into OH, AHP's programs and that the Corps would provide a model of how the whole business of archaeology and historic preservation could be done. The birth of CRM. Archaeologists were not entirely sanguine about hopping into bed with the historic pr preservation and feared that the National Register would be a catalog of of archaeological sites ripe for looting. Some object, objected to the rubric historic preservation because their primary interests were in prehistory. Some regarded preservationists as rather effete, parts of an Eastern establishment that they, as rough and tough Westerners viewed with disdain. At the same time, there was interest in relating what was coming to be called conservation archaeology. That is the practice of archaeology under the environmental and pr preservation laws to the rapidly co coagulating body of policy and relatively well-funded well practice called natural resource management. So in the early 1970s, archaeologists in the southwestern United States began calling what they did cultural resource management, unquote. The unfortunate results of this ter terminological pr pr 
appropriation remain with us today, equating CRM with archaeology at worst and with historic preservation at best, has allowed agencies and project proponents proponents to ignore the rest of the cultural environment. Indeed, it has encouraged them to do so. When archaeologists invented CRM, they didn't bring the full range of cultural resources into the mix. They brought archaeology by, but natural resource managers, project planners, and agency officials didn't and didn't don't know what know that. So they assume that when they fund CRM, they're they're taking care of cultural resources. Of course, they are not. This will be the end of chapter one on cultural resource management. Thank you.